in the future humanity may travel to many strange new worlds and make homes on them, but we may also build giant space habitats for humanity to call home. Probably one of the most popular topics on this channel is space habitats, but usually we're either discussing one specific type out of many, like an O'Neill Cylinder, or we're just mentioning them in passing as this sort of inevitable future for all mankind. Folks coming to the channel can be surprised sometimes how we talk about them less as things we might build a few of, and more as a mass manufactured archipelago that will eventually house the supermajority of humans, instead of planets being their main homes. Space habitats are very different from a basic space station like those we have now, and are cost prohibitive until we have a much larger presence in space, like mines and forges on the moon, as well as greater energy abundance and better automation that is able to handle much of the production, so humans aren't individually welding each plate of the habitat's floor together by hand. It is very likely though that we will reach those benchmarks inside this century in which case, much as high-rises and skyscrapers become economical with cheap steel, enormous cylinder and ring-shaped habitats spinning to produce artificial gravity may become much cheaper than trying to buy any free space on Earth, where land values are likely to keep rising as we simultaneously grow in numbers and try to grow the number of protected natural environments or restore them. And much of this can seem incredibly counterintuitive at first. Today we're going to take a little time to review the basics of what space habitats are, how they work, and why their human populations might outnumber the population living on planets, but I thought we'd explain the various types and their advantages by giving some example cases for each major one, and I thought we would begin by discussing the idea of using them for nature preserves. And here we are talking mostly about habitat purpose today rather than megastructural type an exhaustive overview of which can be found in our two hour long episode, The Megastructural Compendium. One of the more common notions people will suggest for fixing our world and helping to significantly reduce extinctions is to settle some new worlds and build some space habitats and evacuate humanity to those, leaving only a tender crew of people or even robots to help restore this planet to its previously pristine condition. Now this is where space habitats come in and that would seem like an incredibly expensive alternative to just buying some land for a nature preserve, but as time goes on and humanity gets better with automation and space travel, there's not likely to be any place with higher real estate values than on Earth, so it would probably be ultimately cheaper to build new space habitats for endangered critters than to buy land here on Earth for them. We will bypass entirely the notion that we might force people off Earth. I have often heard folks suggest that, and I think they're just not thinking about that notion and all that it entails. Forced migration should never be high on your list of problem solving tools, and telling someone they need to abandon their tribal lands or the farm their family has tended for generations or the tombs of their ancestors or their holy lands isn't going to go over well with lots of people. Alternatively, what is neat about space habitats is you can build them very customizable in conditions and sizes, and you can also move them. So we might contemplate relatively small ones for specific endangered species that do not need a huge food chain under them, or even a huge one for creatures that need enormous land space like elephants. In either case you can ensure that dangerous predators or parasites for that protected species are not in that habitat. A cylinder habitat floating in the vacuum of space, whose outer hull is surrounded by vacuum and constantly bathed in radiation, is very protected from invasive species. Indeed, you could even unleash tailored viruses or small hunter killer drones to handle species you need to remove from an environment that snuck in. Which would seem like overkill or bad management, honestly, but it's an option that it's available. Whereas doing that in a single shared environment like Earth is killing off an entire species and risking mutation. So too, such habitats avoid the risk of having all of your eggs in one basket. You can build multiple of the same type of biome preserve for redundancy, and they can be built as needed. What's more, they can be funded not just by donations and taxes, but by selling the land on Earth. 
Right now that would not work economically, an acre of space station is going to cost you many billions of dollars compared to maybe a thousand for some existing woodlands, but a few thousand years from now it's entirely possible that an acre or hectare of land on Earth will run the modern equivalent of billions of dollars. Whereas space habitats might be as cheap as dirt, with that literally being the most expensive part. There's also the issue that Earth doesn't have enough space, especially if you want redundancy. Before humanity started making changes to our planet, everything was in competition with each other and things were getting wiped out, not with the same rapidity as the human era, but it was still the norm for things to diverge and then get wiped out. And we mustn't romanticize Darwinianism like some X-Men comic book villain like Apocalypse, nature isn't really picking and choosing for ever better life. There's just a gross statistical effect of life forms generally being better at surviving over long enough periods, and things can die off just from climatic cycles making places colder or drier or vice versa. It can also be fairly arbitrary, for instance right now your most important survival trait as an organism on Earth is to be viewed as cute and cuddly to humans, or to be good at living in a concrete jungle or suburban environment. Space habitats avoid these unexpected changes because we can keep a space habitat's climate exactly as we want, or change it when we want. So we want room to make sure various plant and animal species get protected, where they can still diverge, and where we can still have some room for resurrecting extinct species from their preserved DNA, or experiment with interesting variations without risking them wrecking a local ecosystem if we include them in it then we want to have more places to do that than just Earth's surface alone. There is a lot of room to grow, as not only can some of these preserves be around any of the billions of stars in this galaxy, but our sun alone produces 2 billion times the sunlight than what actually hits Earth, meaning we can build 2 billion times Earth's surface area before we run out of locally available sunlight. That means that even if only one in a thousand of the available habitats or sunlight around the sun was used for nature preserves and zoos, it would represent two million times the space Earth has, and even then, we might augment things with fusion reactors or black hole generators to power even more around our sun, though again we've billions of other stars that appear to be empty of intelligent life at the moment. Indeed they might harbor life too, maybe just simple life, And while it might be best to leave those planets be if they're not very common, we would still probably be smart to build some space habitats for those alien planets too, as backups. And again, space habitats are mobile so you can shift to other solar systems if you want. Now when it comes to space habitats, size is often viewed as big or being better, but in practice you never really want to have to build more than you need. Where rotating cylinder habitats are concerned, they can be very long on their axis, but the wider you try to make them, the more strain it puts on the floor. It is essentially the same as a suspension bridge, whose length is the same as the habitat's circumference, and like a suspension bridge, the more asphalt and cars, or dirt and water, you pile on top of it, the stronger it needs to be. We usually estimate that modern steel could handle a habitat several miles or kilometers across, and materials like titanium or kevlar could do even better. This is the reason the classic Island 3 O'Neill cylinder is 5 miles or 8 kilometers in diameter, and 20 miles or 32 kilometers long. As in the 1970s when it was designed, that was considered as big as available materials could safely go, though again you can make them much longer, even to the point of being more like a rope than a cylinder or ring. It would be well within modern materials to double that diameter or more, and super strong materials like graphene could potentially allow a diameter of 1000 miles, should we perfect the art of mass manufacturing it. Graphene is made of carbon, as is diamond, which we can also make now and is ultra strong, and carbon is one of the most abundant materials in the solar system, and universe, so we have lots of raw material we can build space habitats out of compared to what we can do with iron or steel or aluminum, let alone rare materials like titanium. Hence space habitats like New Giaga 6 BC, which seeks to emulate the natural environment of Giaga County, Ohio in the year 6000 BC, shortly after the last ice age. Giaga is raccoon in the Seneca language if you're curious, one of my favorite critters, and the county is the one next to my own and has 400 square miles or 1000 kilometers of land, 
and would require just a little more land than the Island 3 design, by the building about a mile wider or a few longer. New Giaga 6 BC does allow visitors, unlike some habitats, but doesn't allow any hunting as many do, and while it is quite large, it is still necessary for scientists to occasionally inseminate some of the larger animals with outside DNA to help avoid the risk of bottlenecking. That's not true of the Great Congo McKendry Cylinder in orbit out past the Moon, which was built principally with African forest elephants in mind and is thrice as big as the Congo back on Earth, so it is assumed it's big enough to support a genetically diverse population, especially as elephants are pretty big and hard to miss, so the scientists who monitor the habitat can occasionally splice in some fixed DNA if any bottlenecking occurs anyway, or which it might considering how in danger they were in the 20th and 21st century. Siberia Park, a nearby neighbor of the Great Congo and similar in size, employs some of the best geneticists as it's the home of many extinct Ice Age creatures like mammoth and saber-toothed tigers, which they've restored. Siberia Park also augments the food supply of its rather barren tundra by having many ancillary space farms nearby that deliver fodder for the environment to allow a higher density of life, so that visitors can enjoy seeing mammoths while skiing down the many slopes. Space farms are very common in an era where most folks live in space, as many people like living at suburban density and habitats intended for human occupation needed more features than a simple one for growing food, these are often smaller and vastly cheaper farm stations where everything is kept to a minimum in terms of structure, and the conditions are tailored to the crop or crops in question, in terms of lighting intensity, duration, humidity, temperature, gravity, and year length. Many are entirely automated and connected to large habitats by physical tethers that containers can ship back and forth along. This is not just for feeding people and their pets, either. People like wildlife in their habitat, but you can pack a lot more cute critters into an environment if you're supplementing the food chain. This can be fairly inventive too, like Ganrisu, a Japanese space habitat famous for its walnut trees and slightly genetically altered squirrels, who have been trained to pick up any bits of litter and carry them to garbage receptacles and get a bunch of nut-like food pellets from it as a reward. Though this has resulted in them often stealing non-trash items from picnickers to trade in. For every nature preserve in the future, there's dozens of habitats focused on human habitation, many with very lush parks which do use space farm augmentation to keep up a high furry critter population beyond what could be supported by the landscape, especially as many of those landscapes are ornamental gardens patrolled by drones that tend them and chase off curious critters who might want to graze on the artwork. Habitats are bound to have some themes that are fairly common, but I doubt we would ever see tons of identical habitats being built in terms of interior design, even if we might have standardized hulls. That standardization might be in construction and diameter, as you could probably do segments of a certain length, say 100 meters or yards, and just bolt more on until you got the desired length, like a train adding cars, only without the actual break between them for one long, flowing, connected landscape though very long ones might go for actual segments to help with safety concerns of a blowout. Science fiction tends to exaggerate that too, spacecraft and spaceships leak, it just comes with the territory, but someone shooting a hole in your hull with a pistol is not going to result in everyone being sucked out through that tiny hole. And because the difference is only one atmosphere of pressure between normal Earth air and the vacuum of space, you could plug a hole like that with your thumb and then slide a simple patch under it. Fear of depressurization should not be overlooked, and will need to be a major issue which designers seek to address for people to feel safe bringing their kids to live on a space habitat, but it is worth remembering that even a hole you could drive your car through, leaking air into space on something like an O'Neill cylinder, is going to need to bleed air for hours, before any noticeable drop in pressure station-wide would occur. That might be a hole leaking a million liters of air per second, but it's tiny when you consider that station has several quadrillion liters in total, and would need decades to bleed out. Nonetheless, many might opt for segmentation, possibly like sausage links, to allow a long stream of cylinder habitats to be connected together in a chain or accordion style, which has the advantage of letting you shuffle them and add or remove segments. Now in theory there is no need for segments to have the same diameter either, but we do have an upper size limit based on material strength, 
which as mentioned is several miles for steel and maybe a thousand for graphene, but both the economics and practical engineering will probably control those and set lower minimums. Overall though, the wider a spin gravity habitat, the more Earth-like the conditions on it. There is also such a thing as too small, and we believe if your station is rotating more than twice per minute, it might cause nausea in some, like twirling around does, and might have a greater impact on some organisms over others. And it is always important to remember that space habitats are never just humans, they're not space houses, they're space environments, complete with other flora and fauna, and reasonably self-sufficient, just relying on neighbors for occasional exchanges of DNA, though many might trade heavily too. We are pretty confident 2 RPM or less will be fine for humans and other organisms, and that means a diameter of no less than 447 meters or 1467 feet. For Earth-like gravity anyway, you could simulate Martian or lunar gravity at a much smaller diameter without needing to exceed 2 RPM, and for short-term space exploration, we are pretty sure most people could be comfortable with 6 RPM and maybe the occasional anti-nausea pill for some. Which is why you see plans for space stations with rotating sections for near future use that are not the size of football stadiums. Visiting or working at a space station for a little while, especially when we have a huge pool of recruits like we have for astronauts these days, is very different than trying to have babies on them or having people prone to getting seasick, or some vital pollinator species that could not cope with much spin. And only time and experimentation will help us fine tune what we need. Now this is centrifugal force, and in this context we call this spin gravity, and while we may one day discover a means of generating gravity like they do in so many fictional spaceships in sci-fi, right now spin is the only trick we have besides piling lots of mass in one place. And we have space habitats that use that method too, which we'll come back to. For the moment, people often wonder why they don't magically start floating if they jump up on a space station that's spinning. Inside that station, if you jump up, gravity is pulling you right back down again and in accordance with general relativity, acceleration and gravity have the same effect and cannot be distinguished from each other. When you jumped up in the air, the cylinder kept spinning under you, and you kept moving forward with it, same way as your body doesn't magically stop going straight just because your car turned around a corner, if it turns it exerts force on you, and you turn. Here you jump up but you're still moving in the direction of that spin, and just ram back in the side of the cylinder a few feet later, which was spinning at the same speed and catches up with you, plus or minus the variance based on rotational rate. This effect is true on any spinning object, including Earth. The big difference in gravity on such a habitat is whatever the gravity is on the floor, it is zero up at the middle, and would be half at the halfway point to the middle. If your cylinder has a radius of 1000 meters, if you're on a building 100 meters tall, putting you at 90% of that full radius, the gravity would be 90% of normal. On Earth the gravity is lower 100 meters up, but very little, and on a bigger cylinder habitat the effect would be less too. I think the problem here is that people are thinking that if they just appear in mid-air inside a cylinder habitat they should just float there, and indeed that would be exactly what would happen if we had some magical portal we could send you through and there was no air either. We don't have that, what we do have is some giant open air habitats with rim walls like Bishop Ring Forest 1997, a continent class woodland environment with a 2000 km diameter located at the Earth L4 point with the Sun, commissioned to replicate the environment of the Great Plains of North America, and of about the same size. While enjoying all the modern technology of its era, it superficially resembles late 19th century Mississippi River architecture, styles, and culture. Indeed a lot of the habitats have contracts which inhabitants would have to sign, about reasonable cultural and style preservation, if they aim for a theme for the habitat, some of which might make the most nitpicky homeowners or condo association look reasonable. That is one advantage of space habitats using spin gravity, they are very easy to leave and you can have your own personal spaceship that requires far less cost and engineering skill than the first spaceships humans made in the 20th century indeed not much more than those forced automobiles, so it is easy enough to migrate. It is also very likely that space habitats will tend to clump together rather than being evenly distributed throughout the solar system, 
and would probably often dock to each other or connect via a tether for physical transport and sharing high speed data or power cables, or even large water pipes if they really wanted to. But entire space habitats could migrate if they decided they didn't like their neighbors or wanted to join another country. Also, you could potentially have spaceship houses that could dock into space habitats, with empty lots covered with a dome that folks could lease, park their ship in, and have the dome fold back to include them. Though this is likely to require checks to make sure you're not bringing invasive species with you, including unwelcome species of grass to the habitat's lawn. Though trying to keep out things like fleas or gut microbes coming over on or in larger organisms would be trickier, which is why a very closed nature preserve might limit what goes inside to robots we could sterilize and control remotely and frozen sperm or embryos to introduce genetic diversity. On space habitats in general though, quarantine and inspection is likely to be less rigorous than that but still a common practice in a future of billions of space habitats, but the good news is that the nature of the setup means you can lock things down rather quickly and in a very ironclad way if you need to. It is possible to imagine some habitats having guest policies that require them to use remote drones or virtual reality during visits or initial quarantine. On that note, it is very likely a human habitat would have its own digital ecosystem, internet, and local virtual worlds, though many might be within a light second of thousands of other habitats to share without much signal lag. We have a lot of options for conglomerations of habitats too, not just the sausage link variety but something more like a honeycomb or soccer ball or chain link fence or net, or the rung ward setup. Many of these are discussed by name and type in the Mega Structural Compendium episode. I would say you might get some neat shapes and geometries of bigger habitat conglomerations, but suspect you would tend to have a lot of mutable and shifting and rarely complete conglomerations, rather than nice organized shapes. A lot like any organization or development, static 100% usage is just an ideal, not something you ever really get. Though a habitat undergoing major repairs or refurbishment could be removed and towed away, as opposed to a vacant and decaying building in a community nowadays. You could have some enormous dry docks too, designed for holding your neo cylinders for easy construction and repair. It's honestly not like you'd have a single big station spinning around by itself either, indeed it is likely to be enclosed in some non-rotating protective superstructure anyway, either by itself or with some partners and probably whole sea of smaller specialized facilities like the local robotic space farms where the floor is centimeters thick not meters to save on cost, and possibly giant defense systems and massive sales of solar collectors and mirrors. A lot depends on how the lighting is coming in too, whether we are artificially producing it by massive LED light bulbs or reflecting it through mirrors, lenses, and fiber optics, or even just using large transparent sections which I am not a big fan of, even if you got a strong material like diamond for the job, because I feel that wastes space, but that's more of a personal opinion than an engineering flaw. Incidentally, I know we keep discussing cylinders and rings, but they're not the only space habitat shapes. Indeed, they're not even the only spin gravity options. For spinning gravity, you really need the object to be mostly symmetrical around the axis it is spinning on. Minor defects are okay, even intentional ones like dimples and rises to allow valleys or hills without using lots of extra dirt and rock. However, it doesn't need to be symmetric down that axis of rotation, so it could be pill shaped instead of cylinder shaped and the gravity at the ends just gets lower as it narrows. You could do some interesting low gravity mounted ecologies in such places and avoid some of the engineering issues with cylinder caps. And in the same way you could do chains of such habitats narrowing then widening again every so often to allow a safety sphincter to be installed that could close in order to separate segments, and those wouldn't need to be so huge. I think you might have a lot of river valley setups done this way too, as cylinder habitat mechanics allow for unlimited length, so you can basically set yourself up like a traditional Egyptian kingdom, 5 miles wide and the whole river long which can potentially be millions of miles or longer, as we see with the Topopolis. But as we mentioned earlier, space habitats can also be made so that the way they generate gravity is by normal mass. We won't dwell too long on this as we have a dedicated episode for shellboards, even those with concentric layers, and a whole episode on massive marine habitat options including the Hydro Shell. 
The Hydro Shell is an interesting hollow world option which is intentionally low gravity, having very deep seas but only compared to Earth's oceans, not Earth's entire radius, molten core and all. It is basically a planetary crust minus the mantle and core, and covered in water. The low gravity is interesting in this because normally, our problem with doing deep sea habitats on space stations is that all that depth and mass is very rough on any spinning object. Kilometers deep of sea is doable, but really is not the optimal use of matter that we aim for with spinny habitats. Here though you can have enormous deep sea environments where the pressure rises only very slowly with depth, because of the lower gravity. And amusingly the gravity gets weaker as you descend, causing pressure to rise even more slowly, allowing for marine habitats of a depth which no planet could ever permit. See that episode, Oceans in Space, for details. And this is the fundamentally coolest thing about space habitats, they permit more options, in that you can more closely replicate conditions on Earth than you ever could by terraforming any plants we currently know of, but you can also produce environments far stranger than anything likely to naturally occur. You could build for the perfect efficient city layout, or suburban sprawl, or the country club villa, or even a habitat for one family with a giant mansion, golf course, and forest all its own. And you aren't building it on top of something somebody else once called home, but rather made from dead lifeless floating rock through empty space, or even star-lifted, and way less of that rock than it would take to generate living area via a classic planet, where you need meters of rock and hull beneath you, not thousands of kilometers. The consumption for something like this would be much less, even using a shellboard option, hollow rock with a center stuffed full of dense abundant gas like hydrogen or helium, or even dark matter or an artificial black hole. Or you can cut down on the gravity and have immense hollow air-filled habitats a human could fly in by flapping their wings, in which oases of rock and sea might float to land on and on which life might grow. Indeed you might grow space habitats organically, like giant trees growing out of asteroids by some hybridization of nanotech and genetic mastery. They let you make strange places for people to visit, or safe havens for nature to persist, or customized communities for families to prosper. As to motivations to make them, well there's always just the need for more space to grow. Humanity may hit a temporary peak population sometime this century, personally I doubt it, but whether we do or not, if we did, that would be partially because people felt a concern about us not having enough space for more people, but a future with space habitats gets around that, and is very handy if we also have a future of extended longevity, where folks might be in good shape and still fertile, and look 20 or 30 when they're 200 or 300. So above all else, growing room is an option, both for more people and upgrade how much space each person has. But smaller habitats might also be important, it's the safe place to bring your small subculture that you're afraid will be drowned among its bigger neighbors or possibly burnt at the stake by them. For some religions it can be the promised land, and technically even requires traveling the heavens to get to, and is where they can be in isolation to the degree they want. So too for any number of ideologies or economic systems, it is 10 million communes, each founded on their own to rise or fall on their own merits. It is the laboratory where you can experiment with genetics or nanotech without fear you'll infect the local ecology and wreck an ecosystem, where a nuclear bomb in the basement can stop an unchained hostile AI from spreading out, or erase the evidence of the mistake or illegal enterprise. It is a safe trading ground for militaries, free from enemy spying, and risk to civilian populations or environments. It is the giant Woodstock campground millions come to once a year to watch bands play for a couple weeks and grows wheat or corn or cows the rest of the time. It is the mobile stadium on an eccentric orbit whose team plays against local teams as it passes by their habitats. It is the university meant for quiet contemplation. It is the idyllic pasture or vineyard habitat that appears in so many poems and stories. It is the river a million miles long with riverboats that tour it over a century-long trip. It is the world where the sun never sets or where the sun rises at 8am, peaks at noon, and sets at 8, because it doesn't need to actually move at the same rate all day long. 
It is the one where the day is 25 hours long and a year is exactly 400 days. It is a world where you can float in the crystal blue sea among endless archipelagos of paradise-like tiny islands, or float in the air near the axis and just glide down when you're done, and on which there may be entire layers of ecology kilometers high and deep. It is a place for many wonders, though potentially many awful things too, private paradises whose insides are hidden from scrutiny and which like some private island retreat might include some nightmares. Fundamentally though, they offer us the chance to build almost any world we might dream of, and very, very many of them, as they create living areas thousands of times more efficiently from raw materials like asteroids than clumping them together as planets does. Quadrillions of O'Neill Cylinder habitats could be supported in this solar system alone, all the size of a county and home to a million people each, or maybe no one at all, just a habitat where some engineered creature taken from mythology like unicorns or dragons roam in peace, as a testament to our ingenuity, or ego, or maybe both. So one more motivation to make them comes to mind and perhaps as an even greater one than simply growing room for more humans, rather the desire for more to imagine, design, and build. To make entire new worlds is an ambition few would call feeble or wrong-headed I think, and as awesome as standing on a mountain peak is, it must surely pale in comparison to standing at the peak of a mountain that you imagined, designed, and built. A future in space and of immense space habitats can sometimes seem like a distant and impossible goal, but it's one we reach by learning a little more every day, and that's the same for us in our own life goals and learning. The secret to achieving huge learning goals and staying sharp for a lifetime is learning a little every day, and that is a secret that is shared by so many of the world's most successful and productive people. They learn something new every day. If you think that sounds too hard or too time consuming or just too overwhelming, then you haven't tried Brilliant.org. Dream big, then figure out the knowledge and skills you need to make those dreams a reality and pursue them, and let Brilliant be your partner. To really learn anything, you've got to do it. Brilliant's visual, hands-on approach is such an effective and engaging way to master the key concepts behind today's technology, which is critical to staying ahead. You can try it yourself with a 30 day free trial and see what a difference it makes to learning math, science, and computer science, from the basics to advanced material. With Brilliant you can learn at your own pace, learn on the go, and learn a little something new every day. To get started, for free, visit Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur or click on the link in the description and the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. As usual, this episode featured a lot of art by various volunteer animators showing us awesome megastructures no one has ever animated before and often barely even sketched. And as much as AI art has been improving, it's not there yet. Those visuals are worth a thousand words when it comes to explaining these topics and I'm grateful to all of those artists, who you can see in our credit roll at the end of each episode. And I want to give a special shout out today to my friend Neil Blevins, whose recently released book, Megastructures, contains so many great pieces of mind-blowing art, some of which you saw today. Speaking of mind-blowing, next week's episode is going to take us to the edge of the galaxy and far beyond, as we contemplate not just journeys to other galaxies beyond the Milky Way or Andromeda, but even other superclusters, in Intergalactic Voyages. Then it will be time for our Sci-Fi Sunday episode about surviving in the ruins of civilization after an apocalypse. Then two weeks from now, we'll look at the advanced technologies we're using to explore ancient ruins in The Future of Archaeology. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching and have a great week. <laughs>